I want to thank you all for coming in so reverently and quietly. You've invited the Spirit to the sacred place. And I should ask you that as we leave that you may do the same. We'll start with an opening song. Our Savior is pulling to. It'll be sung by everyone, and that will be followed by an opening prayer given by Austin Rose. They traded comfort for a car, left their homes with aching hearts, and must have felt alone out on the place. Mothers watched their babies die, fathers must have wondered why, and left a trail of tears and so much pain. Through the storms and bitter cold, they didn't let them pass, or the unknown future quench their flame of fame. He was their light, he walked their path, when their burden seemed too hard to carry, they chose to look up. And they knew he was pulling to Please remove your hats. Dear, our kind, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much 
for all that we have and for allowing us to be here today. We thank you for this great trek that we've had so far and for all the leaders that have put so much effort in making this uh, a unique experience for all of us. Thank you for the performers and all the time they have put into their work and for the great spirit that is here as we walk across this sacred ground. Please bless us all that we may be able to remain reverent and feel the spirit for the rest of the day. And we say in his name that love of Jesus Christ. Amen. We will now hear some remarks given by President Hunt, followed by the musical number. Um, because because they believed performed by the Trek Choir. It'll be followed by the Rock Creek Hollow performance. And then we'll have a closing prayer given by Bishop Ragsdale. Thank you, Connor. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Here we are gathered in yet another sacred place. And, uh, and it's good to be here. I have a feeling there are a few of us looking forward to a warm shower. Would I be correct about that? Yeah. Having a hard time hearing? Okay, I'll try to speak up. Sorry about that. You know, I know that uh, we're in a reverent and sacred environment here, but I just don't think we can let this moment pass while we are all together without thanking a few of those who have put in so much effort to make this such a highly successful event. And I will undoubtedly leave some out, so I want to apologize in advance. But let's start, for example, with, uh, with Sister Holly Murray, and in fact, the whole Murray family. I think it would be appropriate for us to give them a round of applause. For all of our music. Some of you may not know that Michael Murray, seated right over at that table, soon to be a new husband and medical student, wrote our theme song for this year. And so thank you, Michael, for sharing your talents with us. And let's, uh, and let's have a round of applause, too, for uh, Jody Sabrowski and Raylene Anderson and, and Debbie Norton. You know who they are, seated up on the front row. I, I told them this morning that I'm not sure how many more coupons we have to use to secure their services for stake treks, but uh, they once again have uh, added so much to the spirit of this event, and th thank you, sisters, for doing that. And um, I have a suspicion that those who perhaps worked harder than anyone this week may, may not even be here with us. How many people do we have here who, are, who participated on our food committee? Would you raise your hands? Okay, we have a couple. We, we have a couple. I'm pretty sure the others... I'm pretty sure the others are probably still back at camp slaving away, but uh, having seen what they do uh, in the kitchen there is, is just mind-boggling how, how they put that all together. Um, I'm going to thank a few other people here. Uh, we also had involved in our programs, as you all know, Robin and Wendy Clark from the Lone Hall Award. Where's Ephraim? Are you still here, Ephraim Hanks? There he is, back here, sitting on the back row. Thank you, Robin and Wendy. Chris Wooden, Jody Russell, Katie Clayton, who helps so much with, uh, with, our, with our programs. I want to recognize someone else who I am so happy to have in our stake, and if you don't know her yet, you need to. She's our photographer, Rose Mason. Where is Rose? Oh, she's posted on the hilltop up there. Thank you, Rose. And let's give uh, some thanks, too, to Brother John Crossman, our cameraman and brother Bart, who I've already forgotten his last name, Crab. John and, and Bart, who have been our videographers this week. Let's give them a round of applause. And you know, there, there are so many others. Our stake young men and young women's presidencies. Are you here? Can you stand up wherever you may be? President Fulner, President Sabi, and counselors. If, if you're here and, and secretary, thank you for all that you've done. I want to thank our medical team, Doctors Valentine, Johnson, and Anderson. Wave wherever you may be, and thank you for keeping us healthy. We had two uh, two real heroes from our high council, Brother Doug Smith and Brother Doug Later. The Dugs. Where are the Dugs? This is this is not their first trek either, and they've done so much. 
There's so many of us. I left Jenny Eaton off our programs committee. Jenny, thank you. I'm over here sitting with Dave. I knew I was going to make mistakes, and, and, and there are undoubtedly others who I've left off, but uh, there is uh, one couple who we cannot afford to miss who have literally been angels among us for the past uh, several months. Um, President Laura, Pre President Laura. <laughs> okay, President <laughs> Allen and Sister Laura Astle. Would you two stand and let us recognize you? Thank you. Um, I want to be as brief as I can be here today, but I have a couple things that I just really want to say. Um, number one, you're all remarkable young men and young women. I've had so many comments this week about how remarkable the youth of our stake are. And you truly are just incredible young men and young women. We're blessed to be here with you. Um, in, the, in the spring of, in, in the year 1829, a young man who was just a couple years older than most of you, 24, started work on his translation of the gold plates. And in the year 1830, after he had finished his translation, he convinced Martin Harris to pledge his farm so that the Book of Mormon could be printed. And, uh, and they printed about 5,000 copies of it in Palmyra, New York, at E.B. Grandin's printing shop. I'm fortunate to have one of those copies with us here today. And I would be uh, happy to let any of you who may feel so inclined hold this and perhaps flip through it. If you do um, have a chance to look at it, you'll note that when the Book of Mormon was first written, it was written like a novel. There, there are no verses. It's long paragraphs and long pages and long chapters that bear little resemblance to the Book of Mormon that we read today. It wasn't until 1879, 50 years later, that Brigham Young instructed Orson Pratt to reformat the Book of Mormon into the format as we read it today. I, uh, we, we asked you to do some hard things to prepare for this trek. One of those hard things was to get through the Book of Mormon. I hope that, uh, I hope that you did that. Um, for me and in my life, whenever I run into obstacles or perhaps when doubts creep in, I crack open this book and I read some of its chapters and I ask myself, these questions. Is it possible that a 24-year-old young man without the benefit of any formal education, really having nothing to read other than the King James Version of the Bible, sat down and literally dictated this book from cover to cover without the benefit of notes, without the benefit of a manuscript, without ever going back and rereading what he had already translated and dictated? Is it possible that an uneducated farm boy could possibly create this book of scripture? Every time I ask myself that question, I, uh, I find myself disbelieving that as, as even a possibility. But the reality is that Joseph Smith was not an uneducated farm boy. He was uh, instead a prophet of God. A prophet called to be the head of this dispensation at an age 14. He too had to be 14 before he could begin his trek in reestablishing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And at age 14, as that process began, at eight, in 1830, at age 24, as that process continued with the publication of the Book of Mormon, the Prophet Joseph Smith did a remarkable work. As I read through the Book of Mormon this time around, I was struck with just a couple of thoughts that I want to share with you very quickly. When we walked in today into the amphitheater, you all passed a rock, a monument, that was uh, dedicated by President Hinckley, I believe originally, and President Faust and President Monson, who have subsequently visited this place. And on the word, on, on that monument is, a, is one word boldly featured and prominent. Does anyone remember what that one word is? Remember. Remember. I think that uh, they chose that word for a very important reason. Their message to us, those who are participating in the second rescue, is to remember. Let me just share with you a couple of lines out of the Book of Mormon that use those words. 
One is taken from Mosiah, King Benjamin's discourse, where he says this, I would desire that ye should consider on the blessed and happy state of those that keep the commandments of God. For behold, they are blessed in all things, both temporal and spiritual, and if they hold out faithful to the end, they are received into heaven. That thereby they may dwell with God in a state of never-ending happiness. Never-ending happiness. Oh, remember, remember that these things are true. For the Lord God has spoken. So although today a warm shower may make us happy today, it is living the gospel of Jesus Christ that leads us to a state of never-ending happiness and enables us to really, truly be happy. A page earlier from this same discourse, we learn another important lesson where King Benjamin says, And behold, I tell you these things, that ye may learn wisdom, that ye may learn that when ye are in the service of your fellow beings, ye are only in the service of your God. Now you all know that verse of scripture, and, and uh, recall with me for a minute another setting where the Savior himself gathered his disciples for what we know as the Last Supper. And there, knowing what he was about to face in the Garden of Gethsemane and on Calgary, Calvary, what did he do? Anyone remember what the Savior did as an example to his disciples? After dinner, he he gird himself about and with his own robes he washed the feet of his disciples. To me that has always been a stunning act at a moment in time when when our Savior himself knew what he was about to face. And then after he did that he turned to his disciples and he said, if I your Lord and Master do this for you, you likewise do this for others. And then he said, happy are ye if ye do this. And so I know that for the past three days we've been pummeled by the thought that all of us are called in, in these days and at this time to participate in the second rescue and to go out and to help others enjoy the blessings of the gospel that we enjoy. I hope that as you leave today, you will never forget the lessons that we've learned in that regard. And finally, as I read through the Book of Mormon this time around, I was reminded that this book is drenched, literally drenched, in what the missionaries call the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine that gets us back into the presence of our Heavenly Father. The Savior taught that at the Last Supper too, as he was going around to wash the feet of his disciples. When he got to Peter, what did Peter say? Out of, out of respect for the person whom he recognized as the Son of God, Peter said, No, you will not wash my feet. I'll wash your feet. And the Savior responded to him and said, Peter, you don't understand. If I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. And that, my friends, is the doctrine of Christ. We all have need to be washed by the atoning blood and the atoning sacrifice of the Savior. And if we don't allow ourselves to be rescued ourselves by Him, we have no part of Him, and we'll have no part of Him. So, the path to happiness is living the gospel. The path to happiness is serving others. The path to happiness is applying the doctrine of Christ in our own lives and letting the Savior wash us with His blood. Now, as we conclude today, I... Um, I want to do something that might be a little bit unusual, I don't know, but I, uh, I want to muster every ounce of priesthood power or priesthood keys that a state president is allowed to possess by asking you all to join with me in a prayer where I would like to invoke that priesthood power to hopefully bless the lives of each of you who might have hearts to feel or ears to hear what or, or minds to remember what we've experienced over the past three days. So if you wouldn't mind, I would ask you to kneel at your seats if you can, and those who can't need not. But I would like to offer a prayer. Father in heaven, 
we, a few of thy sons and daughters, and members of the Sandy Utah Crescent State, come to thee on this beautiful afternoon and in this sacred setting. We're grateful for the opportunity we've had over the past few days to experience in such profound fashion the blessings of our pioneer ancestors. We are so grateful, Father, for their sacrifice, for their faith, for their commitment that kept them moving across these plains to go up to the mountain of the Lord where they could enjoy all of the blessings of the gospel in companionship with other Latter-day Saints. We're so grateful, Father, for the blessing to have been here and to have been able to experience these things. And on this sacred site where so many suffered so much, we ask Thee, Father, and I ask Thee as one of Thy humble servants, through the power of the priesthood and priesthood keys, bestowed upon me by an apostle of Jesus Christ, that Thou would bless each and every participant of this trek. I would ask, Father, that Thou would bless each and every one of the young women and young men in our state who participated with us, that they might have an appetite to seek Thee, an appetite to live righteous lives, an appetite to feel the influence of the Holy Ghost, that they might have ears to hear the lessons they're being taught, that they might have hearts to feel the influence of the Spirit that they're feeling, that they might have a desire to know the truth and the wisdom to know where spiritual truth comes from. I would ask thee, Father, to bless each and every one of these young women with the courage and the commitment and the faith of those who walked this very path to do the things required of disciples of Jesus Christ, to believe, to repent, to love, to have faith, to have hope, and to endure to the end, however long each of our journeys may be, and how whatever obstacles each of us may face in life. We know, Father, of the truthfulness of the restoration of the gospel. Bless each of and every one of our young men and young women with that same knowledge, that they might draw close to Thee and know that Thy Son, our Lord and Master, the Savior of this world, is pulling to, that we might all be the beneficiaries of His willingness to rescue us, that we might all in turn turn to rescue another, and in the process, refine ourselves and forge our faith in a fashion that will enable us to live lives worthy of eternal life in thy presence with our families. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Just a word there, run and fall to his knees.
1856, the Willie Company was camping by Sweetwater Water River, not far from the base of Rocky Ridge. They had had next to nothing to eat for several days, and everyone was very weak. Ahead of them lay a long, steep climb in the snow. It was freezing cold, and the wind was blowing snow on their faces, making it hard for them to see where they were going. Many were separated from their families in the buzzards. With frozen feet, hands, and faces, they stopped here in Rock Creek Hollow, where they camped. Many saints lost their lives in this sacred place and are buried in a common grave not far from this very spot. Four of these were children. Samuel Gad, age 10, traveled with his father, mother, and six siblings from England. There, his father and his little brother died along the way but Samuel soon joined them in death after climbing Rocky Ridge. James Kirkwood, age 11, came along with his mother and three other brothers. His brother, Thomas, was crippled and he was pulled in the handcart by his mother and his oldest brother, Robert. This meant that James had the responsibility to carry his youngest brother, Joseph, over Rocky Ridge. Odell Mortensen, age nine, came from Denmark. Her oldest sister was already in Salt Lake and her mother and father and younger brother would come the following spring. Her parents were so anxious to send their children to Zion, so they sent their beloved daughter, Bodil, with their good friends, Elsie and Jens Nielsen. how hard it must have been for little Bodell to leave her family, travel across the ocean, and then across the plains. She had the responsibility to take care of the Nelson's only child, Nails. Together they climbed Rocky Ridge in the snow. Bodell had many friends, but Mary Mortensen, who was also from Denmark, was perhaps her favorite. The sweet children of the Willie Company had tremendous faith and their legacy lives on and influences many. Feel their spirits now as we learn of their stories.
going to climb over Rocky Ridge now. It's going to be very difficult, but don't be discouraged. I know we're all missing Papa. He would want us to be strong. Let's pull for him. The snow is really coming down. Oh, Mother. I am not discouraged. I'm excited to get to Zion. I can make it over this hill. Oh, Samuel, all the children, you're the most excited to get to Zion. Wrap this around your shoulders, keep warm, and lace up your boots tight. Keep up. Mother, you take this. I don't need it. I am strong. Bodale, Brother Nelson and I must pull the handcart over Rocky Ridge together. We need to lighten the load. Keep little Nils with you. Your mama and papa would be so proud of you. Look at what a big girl you've become. Bodale, keep moving and follow the wagons. Don't let go of little Nils. Should I ask her, Daddy? We love you both. Come on, little Niels. We need to keep moving. Um, come quickly. We have to help Mother with the cart. I'm sorry I cannot help you, girls. Be safe on the ridge and I'll see you in camp. Come on, little Niels. Here, I will help you. Mary, let's sing to him. Reether, reether, ronca. Hester, he the blanca. Fool it, he the oven grow. Descal, Niels, read the po. Reether, reether, ronca. Thank you, Mary. What a great friend you have become. Just think, soon we will be playing in the hills of Zion. We will be warm and our bellies will be full. Zion, Mary, Zion. Right now, I'm so cold, and I'm so hungry that I hardly think of playing, or of Zion. Bodiel, do you ever think we'll have enough to eat again? Of course we will, Mary. Everything will be better in Zion. But I do miss Denmark, especially my mama and papa. I wish they were here. And our dear little Danish friends. You must have faith in God, Mary. You're such a dear friend, Mary, and we will be friends forever. Yay, ask your die. Yay, ask your die. I love you. James, what a fine man you have become, and your dear father would be so happy with how you're helping us all so much. And my sweet little man, Joseph, how I love you both. This mountain is hard, boys. Robert and I will pull Thomas. James, you help Joseph over the ridge. We will meet in the hollow. Be strong. Joseph, we can do this. I'll help you. Nine hundred saints came across the seas and plains, hunger and cold, taking some away. You're in despair, and you just don't have the strength. Climb this mountain Standing in your way Can't feel your feet And your hands are frozen through The Father knows 
all that you've been through so let me be the father's hand today my shoulders will bear you up with his strength let me carry you let me bear the cold I am here to share your love Through all you've done, you have been true But this is something you just can't do Let me carry you Bodiel, it is so cold. I know everyone is grieving for their loved ones. Oh, Mary, I'm missing my family so much. And little Niels is not well. He is nearly frozen to death and barely alive. Brother and sister Nielsen are so sad. I fear he will die. My heart is breaking. We need help. Poor little Niels. 
I will gather up some sagebrush for a fire.
who there met me till the sea sea can but as we I merely leave it the scalcy sea paradise who there met me till the sea sea can till we meet As we leave the sacred place, please say goodbye to those who have trekked. Then join us in singing one verse of God be with you.